Howdy, Donovan. I love your content and I always wondered if I'd see anything like the folks that write into your channel. Well, by the grace of God, I think I might have. I'm a long haul trucker covering all across the United States, from Maine to California and back again. I have a few routes that take me through the mountains, deserts, and forests. Just about anywhere you can think of, I've driven through it. It's a solitary life out on the road, and I don't get to see my family and friends nearly as much as I'd like to. I sure miss them and try to call them as often as I can, but the time zone changes and the odd hours can make it difficult. So, like any good trucker, I find ways to entertain myself. In particular, I enjoy calling out on my CB radio. My handle is Big Blue, and I've made quite a few friends out on the road using this little radio. It broadcasts only in a short radius, about 20 miles if the connection is good, and only around 3 miles if there's a big mountain range or something in the way. Well, usually I get a pretty good connection. There's usually always someone out there chattering about politics or reality TV or traffic jams. I like to chat with my fellow drivers about their lives, their kids, and so on. It's not too tough to find something in common with them, and I always point out the police stops and the road closures and weather conditions. I started noticing this phenomenon a while back, and I'm just now piecing together what I believe could be interesting for you. Each time I'd drive through a little town in Oklahoma on my Midwestern route, I'd get odd sounds coming through my CB radio. The first time it sounded like nails on a chalkboard. Well, maybe nails on a chalkboard if the chalkboard was underwater and the nails were from a panther. I don't know. It was unlike anything I've ever heard before. And really, there's not much going on there. They've got a pharmacy and a movie theater and a McDonald's, and that's about it. It used to be booming with some factory work, but I guess that business moved out and left the town pretty stranded. There's got to be only a couple hundred people living in the entire county, so the area is pretty desolate. The only special thing about this spot are these sounds that come through the radio. I don't know why it seems so special to me, only that I never heard anything like that. The second time I drove through, the sound changed. It was like a beeping noise or a dial-up telephone. And then it sounded like a woman singing. It only lasted for about five minutes as I drove through, and I was going about 60 miles an hour at that point. I thought maybe my radio was cross-connecting with something. The next time I drove through, that sound changed again. I slowed down this time and stopped for a sandwich so I could listen more closely. This time, the sound was a terrible scream, like a girl screaming. I just couldn't chalk it up to coincidence or leave it alone. It was just too odd. I walked myself right up to the police station and kept persisting until they sent an officer out to take a listen. When I turned on my radio that time, all I heard was radio static. They all rolled their eyes and laughed at me, but I knew this was real. When I got back in my truck alone, I heard it again. This time it was a scream that sounded like a song. I truly don't know. I drove all around that whole county trying to pinpoint where the sound was stemming from. When I got outside the borders of the town, my radio would get fuzzy and I'd start to hear the usual calls from other truckers. I found myself following as the sound got louder and louder as I approached this empty factory. This was the place that I guess went out of business. Now, I don't know what's going on in there, but it's got to be something that the police know about, because as I approached those front gates, I spotted the same officer that went to listen to the radio with me parked right outside. I have no idea why he'd act like he didn't know where the sound was coming from. But did he lie right to my face? I don't want to get myself in any kind of trouble, so I figured I'd best stay away for a while. Better not to stick my nose in where it don't belong. When I drive through, I still turn my radio up, and each time I hear something new. Sometimes screams, sometimes shrieks, sometimes whispering or beeping, or a combination of every sound imaginable. I don't know. I just don't know. I have a feeling that the police over there must know more than what they're letting on. I'll keep you updated if I see, or more likely hear, anything else. Thanks for doing what you do. Hi Donovan. When I was a teenager, I worked at a restaurant that was in an old farmhouse. The bartender, the busboy, and the owners had all told me that the house was haunted. 
and even some of the longtime diners had stories about encounters with a ghost that supposedly lived there. The odd thing was that the ghost didn't seem to want to scare anyone. It tried to be helpful. A missing kitchen tool would suddenly appear on the counter in plain sight. A misplaced set of keys would show up under the diner's table after three different people had looked in that spot. A kid would suddenly be holding a toy that no one recognized. There were tons of stories like that, and everyone thought of the helpful ghost like a mascot for the restaurant. One day I had gone into work early to do some deep cleaning. I broke the cardinal rule, never go in the basement fridge without letting someone know you were headed that way. The interior lever on the door was tricky, and if the door slammed shut behind you, you were stuck until someone released the door from the other side. Additionally, the basement had a very limited cell service. So there I was, completely alone, in the place, which was not out of the ordinary. I often went in during off hours for deep cleaning and prep work. I realized that we were out of lemons in the kitchen, so I headed downstairs to grab some. My boss never needed to know I had gone downstairs without a buddy. Big mistake. I sent the block that we used to prop the door open skidding across the floor. Without thinking, I went after it, and then heard the door slam behind me. I immediately knew I was in trouble. Not only was it super cold in there, but my boss was going to be super upset with me. She reminded us constantly that we needed to go to the fridge in pairs. I checked my cell phone, no surprise I had no signal. I then got to thinking about how it would be several hours before anyone else would show up, and even longer before someone realized I was missing or headed downstairs for supplies. I thought through my options, which were zero. I just had to wait it out, freezing in my t-shirt and shorts. My teeth started chattering. It was really cold. I started pacing to keep myself warm, occasionally holding my phone over my head to check for a signal. I only needed one bar, but none ever appeared. On what seemed like my 200th lap of the fridge, I had my back to the door when I heard the distinctive thunk of the door handle being pushed from the outside. I whirled around expecting to see my angry boss or a confused co-worker. But there was no one and the door was swinging open. I dashed out of the fridge into the hallway that led to the stairs. I looked around and called out but didn't see or hear anyone. I then ran upstairs. There was no one in the kitchen or the dining room or at the bar. When I peeked out the window, mine was the only car in the lot. And then it hit me, our ghost. It's all I could figure at that point. But the only answer I could come up with was that our helpful ghost had let me out of that fridge, sparing me hours in the cold and also from the horrifying possibility of having to pee in a corner. I never told anyone about my experience because I didn't want to get into trouble but I never laughed at anyone again who said that they had encountered a ghost. And that was the last time I went into the basement alone. Hi there, Donovan. I'm a recent subscriber to your channel. I found your channel when I was looking for answers. I'm not much of a believer in all the paranormal things people talk about. I've always just thought folks were overreacting, letting their imagination run wild. It feels weird to be on the other side now, to have a story to tell that a lot of people will think is fake, but I can swear right now this actually happened. I have a small farm in towns in Delaware, just some chickens and corn to sell, and we keep a cow for our own use, plus a medium-sized garden to feed our family. That's in Newcastle County, about a half hour from Battery Park. Lots of farms out here. We had been having some trouble with something getting into our chickens these past six months or so. I figured it was a fox managing to get under the fence. Couple times lately I'd go out in the morning to find a mess of feathers. Whatever got to the bird, it carried it off to eat. I've got a German Shepherd but he's still mostly a pup and I don't quite trust him to wander around loose. He stays in the house at night but the night this had happened, we penned him up on the enclosed porch because he had gotten into something that made him sick. Nothing serious, but I didn't want him messing up the house. So, when he started carrying on around 2 in the morning, barking and whining, I wasn't sure if he just had to go do his business or if he saw something on the property. Either way, I had to get up and take him outside. 
I did grab my rifle, though, thinking I might catch the fox in the act. The first sign I had that something was wrong was the way my pup was acting. He got out on the grass and sniffed the air, and then whimpered and didn't want to roam. Now usually he just races around like a goof, and I've got to keep whistling for him. But he just stayed near the side of the house and did his thing, then scampered back over to the porch. I let him back in knowing he had a time of it and just figured he still felt ill. While I was out, it made sense to walk out to the hen house and see if everything looked all right. It's a little bit away from the house. As I was heading over there, the cow started bellowing, which is really unusual for her. I decided to stop at the barn first. When I checked on her, she was all right, but really twitchy and all wide-eyed and nervous. I looked around good for a snake. That will spook a cow. I didn't see anything. I let her be and went on to the chicken pen. Once I had gotten ten yards away, I could hear the hens fussing. Something had them all riled up, for sure. I threw the bolt on my rifle so I'd be ready to nail the fox if I saw him. I've got lights up over the pen, and the area was pretty well illuminated. There's two structures for the birds, and a small shed where I keep the feed. I looked through the fence and didn't see anything, but something had them squawking, so I unlatched the gate and went inside. As soon as I got in there, I could smell it. There was a strong scent of sulfur, like you just lit a match. I remember panicking for a second looking for a fire. I guess I just associated sulfur with fire. I wasn't even thinking about the fox now, just sniffing the air and trying to figure out what's that burning. Then I hear a squawk from a bird, and it's just cut short. It came from behind the feed shed. I stood still for a minute knowing that something had just killed a hen. I crept over there real easy with my rifle aimed coming around the corner. When I saw the thing, I almost dropped my gun. That's how shocked I was. It was crouched down low, huddled over the hen it had just caught. It was just as big as a calf with a goat's head and curved horns. And there were damn wings on its back, like something out of a storybook. I just froze, forgetting about the gun in my hand. The thing looked up, and I swear it looked evil. Glowing yellow eyes in its head, all bony and rigid. It was holding that dead hen in these little front legs like you see on a T-Rex, skinny with talons. The thing screeched at me, and the sound was like something straight out of hell, like a cross between an angry giant bird and the scream a cougar makes. I stumbled back and fell on my ass, dropping my gun. Then I scrambled up as quick as I could, scared to pieces it was going to attack me. I snatched up my rifle and pulled the trigger, shooting like a crazy man, not even taking time to aim. The thing took off. It actually flew. These giant bat wings just unfolded, and it launched into the air, carrying the hen. I saw its legs then, hawked like a horse's, and it had a skinny whip-like tail. The thing didn't rise too high, maybe it couldn't. It went about 15 feet up and then flew straight away, not any higher. I shot at it one more time, but I know I missed. I really didn't have much of a chance. Well, I guess I did, but I blew my chance falling on my ass. I went out the next morning looking for something to prove what I saw. There were signs of a scuffle behind the shed and some tracks in the dirt that looked like hooves. But it's been dry and they didn't imprint very well. I took pictures, but you can't really tell what you're looking at. I decided I'm going to get a security camera that's motion activated installed on my property. I'll set it up in the chicken pen and maybe I'll get lucky and get a picture. If I do, I'll send it to you, Donovan. Then I'll have proof there's something weird out here in Delaware farm country. I went to college in Seattle in the early 2000s. I had gotten a fair number of scholarships, so I wasn't too worried about the cost of school itself. But the price of textbooks was a lot more than I had planned. This led me to start looking for a job. I had never had a real job before, so it took a few interviews to secure a position. My resume was a little thin at that point. I landed a gig as a barista at a coffee shop a couple of blocks from the waterfront, kind of near the ferry. It was almost in Pike Place Market, but not the one of the cool spots that got a lot of traffic. The shop was on the bottom level of a building that housed a number of businesses. 
There is a print shop on the corner on our same street level. And on the floors above were offices and a couple of apartments at the very top level. I think the offices were for some sports company and a boating company that operated nearby, but had overgrown their building right on the water. That's what I gathered at least, after working there for a few months. It was January. I had come back early from winter break to pick up a couple shifts, and honestly to escape my extended family that had invaded my parents' house. I guess the timing doesn't really matter that much, except to tell you that it was winter. It was me and one other barista closing up the shop after an incredibly long, boring day. I think we had maybe 10 or 15 customers across my six-hour shift. Anna Marie, the other barista, was counting the till. She was the shift manager and so handled the money at the end of the day and had to walk it down the block to the night deposit. I wiped down half a dozen tables and stacked the chairs, mopped like usual, restocked the beans and made each of us a final cup of coffee for the road, split and bagged up the scones that were left over for Anna Marie and I to take home, really the best perk of the closing shift. I bagged up the trash cans, which was easy since we had so few customers. I took those out back to the alley, propping open the door with a spare crate. It looked like it had snowed a little, which wasn't surprising. There were warnings of an upcoming snowstorm. I think it ended up dumping two or three feet that night. On my way back from the trash, I circled down into the basement where the overstock refrigerator was. I pulled three milks from the fridge and reached down for a fourth. I had perfected a carrying method, but it was precarious. As I managed to grab the final gallon with one finger, I heard this weird sound from deeper in the basement. We never went on that side of the basement. In fact, there was an unfinished wall that blocked off a good two-thirds of it all. We'd been told not to go down there because of flood damage had exposed old pipes and they didn't want us to get tetanus or something. It sounded like trickling water. And when I play it back in my mind even now, there is this faint laughter somewhere in the mix. It wasn't even creepy. It sounded like a normal laugh. But there shouldn't have been someone in the basement laughing. That was the creepiest part. I stood there for who knows how long, probably only a few seconds, before turning to go back upstairs. The sound had stopped and I thought I'd try to convince myself that maybe I just imagined it. I was halfway up the stairs, my attention focused on trying to balance the four gallons of milk. I was out of practice since I hadn't had a shift for a couple of weeks. I lost hold of a container and it had fell bouncing down the steps as it broke open and gush milk down the entire stairwell. I heard someone say, ow, as the milk hit the ground at the bottom of the stairs behind me. I kid you not. That was enough for me. I didn't want to meet whoever was chilling in the basement having a laugh. It was downtown Seattle, so there was always the possibility of random people around. I ran the rest of the way up the stairs and slammed the door behind me, double locking it. I had never understood why there was a lock on that door to begin with, but thinking back, maybe there was a reason. I tossed the milks in the fridge under the counter. I saw that Anna Marie had already left with a night deposit. So I clocked out, grabbed my jacket, and headed out the back door to the alley. I walked up to that bus stop on 2nd and Lenora and went home. I didn't have another shift for a couple of days, so I started to forget what had happened in the basement. But a few days later, I had a last-minute opening shift filling in for another barista who was stuck at the airport in Detroit after their winter break. I got off the bus and made my way carefully down the hill. The snow had stuck around. The shop had actually been closed since my last shift because of that big snowstorm. As I rounded the corner to the front of the shop, I remembered I hadn't cleaned up the spilt milk and how awful that was going to be after it had been sitting there for a half a week. We were on the side street, so the snowplow hadn't come by yet. I stepped wrong and tripped face first into a pile of snow. I dug through with my foot to see what I'd tripped over. It turned out to be a zippered bag from the night deposit. It was locked and it still had money in it, but not very much. There hadn't been that many customers that day. I got to the front and there was glass everywhere on the street mixed in with the snow. The windows were totally shattered and the door was kind of smashed up. I was more nervous at that point and yelled into the shop to see if anyone was inside. I didn't get a response. 
I crept inside. The door was only open with one hinge, so I had to pick it up and set it aside. The snow had blown in and frozen to the tiled floor. The coffee beans were everywhere and the machines were ripped apart. The tables and chairs were thrown around. I looked back through the smashed windows and could see a couple of chairs on the other side of the street, half buried in the snow. The basement door, I swear to God I had locked it, was standing open. The doorknob was twisted off and the bolt was splintered out. I clicked on the light and all the way down the stairwell were these streaks of these weird sparkly slime on the walls and steps which mixed into the frozen puddle of milk at the bottom. I don't know why, but I touched the slime. It stuck to my hand and there was this gritty texture to it. It reminded me of when my dad forced me to gut a fish and the scales had gotten everywhere. It had the same consistency. I went further downstairs. The unfinished wall had been pushed over and there was a giant hole in the wall with pipes bent in every direction. I ran back upstairs and I called Anna Marie to see if she was okay. She answered her phone and told me that when she went to deposit the cash, someone had hit her from behind, and she woke up face first in the snow about 30 minutes later. She said she was so disoriented that her boyfriend had to come and pick her up. She didn't notice any of the windows being broken at that point. I hung up with her and I called my boss, who had been in Punta Cana for the last week, and I told him what was going on. Fast forward a few weeks after that, the police finally did investigate and it looked like the perpetrator came through that wall in the basement. But what in the hell is strong enough to break a concrete wall? The shop is back open now after the owner filed an insurance claim. But I quit a week after that incident, and especially after what happened to Anna Marie. Hi Donovan, I'm not going to sign my name to this because... I'm afraid I might lose my job. I'm a park ranger near Clemson, South Carolina. I'm only sending you this because I think people have the right to know what's out there. There's a cluster of parks here in what we call the Mountain Bridge Wilderness. It includes Tables Rock, Caesars Head, and Jones Gap State Parks. I'm not going to tell you which one this happened in, but they're all pretty close together. I think people should be careful in all of them. First off, I'm not the only person who saw this. The reason I was on this particular trail was because a hiker reported seeing something unusual. He was pretty rattled, but very vague. We all figured it was a hoax of some sort, so I was assigned to investigate it and had to hike six miles out on a trail that ends at a waterfall. This is a pretty rough hike and not very well traveled. Honestly, we have so many waterfalls in this area. People seem to prefer going to the ones that have easy access and end in a shallow pool where their kids can swim. This waterfall is pretty, but it's not very big and it's not very popular. I was looking forward to the assignment. I'm not one for hanging out at the ranger's office or patrolling campsites to make sure no one's breaking the rules. I usually volunteer if there's a job that takes me out further into the woods, like trail maintenance and stuff. So I was hiking this particularly steep stretch before you get to the falls, when some rocks started sliding. Not like a rock slide disaster, just a bunch of smaller rocks and debris cascading down from above me on the trail. We had a lot of deer and some black bears here, and that sort of phenomenon is usually caused by a large animal up ahead. So thinking it might be a bear, I proceeded with caution. I got to the top and looked around before I headed west in the direction of the falls. It's rare to see anyone up here, so I wasn't surprised to see the area was deserted. I was ready to take a load off, so when I got to the falls I found a nice shady flat rock and sat down with my water bottle, figuring I earned a break. I was planning to scout the area afterwards and then head back down. I'm just sitting there thinking about my day when I heard something crashing through the brush on the other side of the falls. The woods are pretty thick back there. I stayed still and quiet, figuring some wildlife was coming to take a drink. Oh, it was something coming to take a drink, but it wasn't like anything I'd ever seen before. I kid you not, this thing looked almost like a deer, but only if the deer had died and started to decay. Its head was just bone, 
a skull with empty eye sockets, but it was definitely alive and moving, not to mention huge. I know anyone else would think I was a lunatic, but I've heard you read a few stories on here before, so I can speak plainly. This thing was dead, dead and somehow alive. You could smell the decaying flesh on its body and see bones poking through here and there on its neck. It had lowered its head to the water like it was going to take a drink, and I'm sitting on the other bank, too scared to even breathe. All I could think was, this can't be real. Then it saw me. It lifted its head in those empty eye sockets and just pointed straight at me, and suddenly I see the red inside, glowing like coals on a campfire. I totally panicked, knowing this thing was some kind of evil. I jumped up and ran, but then I heard a big splash. I turned around, but I was afraid that the thing had jumped into the shallow water and was chasing me. I flew down that trail, crashing into limbs and scraping my face, trying to keep my balance on all the loose rocks. I'm lucky I didn't fall off the mountain and get seriously hurt. By the time I got maybe a mile and a half away, I slowed down and listened. I didn't hear anything behind me. I can't explain what that thing was, but I know what I saw. Maybe it was some kind of evil spirit, although you couldn't see through it. Or maybe there's just creatures out there that we never see, because they've gotten so good at hiding. I also don't know if it was intending to hurt me. Was it chasing me? Seemed like it, but who's to say? There was an undeniable aura of... I guess you'd say evil around it. I know I never want to meet up with it again. I didn't report it. Maybe that sounds cowardly, but I don't need to lose my job over this or get told I need to see a shrink. I do think that people should be cautious going into the woods, any woods, and especially that area of South Carolina. There's danger out there. Danger in a form of which you'd never expect. Please be safe, everyone, and don't hike alone. I was a volunteer firefighter when those really bad wildfires hit Northern California. I'm actually from Idaho, but they flew me and some of my friends down there to help out because the blaze was so out of control. It's just unimaginable destruction and made me really sad to see all of those homes and neighborhoods totally destroyed. They had us camping a good distance away from any of the fires. And every night, someone was on watch and radio. We were always on high alert because with the change in wind, miles could easily burn in minutes. I had been there for a week, maybe a week and a half. We had just pulled a 15 or 16 hour day and we were finishing up dinner. So probably close to 11 or 12 at night. This guy Casey comes running over and tells us to follow him to the back of camp. I mean, back of camp is generous because that group had maybe 25 or 30 tents. We followed him to where these train tracks were. He was yelling about some weird sound he heard while he was taking a leak. I couldn't hear anything and neither could anyone else. But Casey was never like this. He was super chill and never made a big deal about anything. I think he was an English teacher or something at one point. I didn't know him super well. I had only worked with him once before. He ran down the train tracks. It was getting dark, but the fires were keeping it somewhat lit out so you could still sort of see what was happening. There was an overall glow to the situation. Casey had a pretty big head start on us, and we soon lost him in some trees up ahead. It was sometime right around then when the wind decided to change. The fire got to us quickly. But you see, the thing is, the fire was there way too fast. It should have taken an hour at least to make the distance that it did, but somehow all of a sudden everything was blazing. The trees, the grass, even the wood of the railroad tracks. I saw that the metal of the railroad tracks was also on fire. None of this was normal. Everything was happening too fast. We were surrounded on every side by walls of fire and it was closing in on us. I looked up and the flames were above us too. I thought I was imagining it at first, but then Nancy, one of the other ladies on the team, started yelling through the roar of the fire. Do you hear that? It was a strange cross between a hiss and a hum. It was deep, but at the same time it was high-pitched. I could feel it under my skin. 
The fire brightened up where Casey had disappeared. The ground began to rumble when I realized the hissing was now coming from below. A giant sort of fireball exploded upwards in front of us. The fire around us grew lower except for in front of us where it grew even brighter. I saw what looked like the outline of a person deep in the fire. I thought it was Casey, but the closer I looked, the stranger it appeared. It was hard to tell, but it was probably seven to eight feet tall. There was no way someone could withstand that heat either. It was impossible. The shrieking humming grew louder and I realized the creature was running towards us. Its front limbs were long and swinging until it got closer and then I felt like it was reaching. I dove out of the way. The flames were trailing with it. It could have been the source of the fire. The second before I blacked out, I rolled over and I got a glimpse of its legs, which looked like hind legs of an animal, maybe a horse or a goat or something like that. I woke up and I didn't know how long I had been out, but it must have been for a while because it was starting to get light out and not just from the nearby wildfires. The sun was coming up and I could see I wasn't the only one who passed out. Nancy and some of the guys were nearby on the ground too. I checked on them all when they were all alive and breathing, but still out. I looked around and saw a giant hole where the railroad track had been. Some of the metal had sort of melted and dripped down the side of the hole. It looked like icicles. I went to the edge of the hole, which was more like a pit, probably at least 10 or 15 feet deep. The sides of it were caked in ash. Turning around, I realized that nothing actually had been burned. The track had melted a bit. A few feet on either side of the pit were a little charred, but everything else was unburnt. Green grass and weeds and the trees were still covered in needles and the trunks were untouched. There was a stripe or maybe a patch of grass that had been kind of burnt. It went from the pit over the hill in the direction of the wildfires. Once everyone woke up and determined nobody was badly hurt, we searched for three or four hours but couldn't find any sign of Casey. I'm not sure what we saw, but we all saw it. Hi Donovan, I appreciate the opportunity to send this to you. I've tried to bring it up before, but it just felt too weird. I'm from Colorado. I was born and raised here, mostly around Denver. I never felt comfortable in the city, so I moved up towards the mountains when I got out of college. I got my civil engineering degree at CU Boulder. Boulder is a reputation for some pretty hippie, dippy types, but I was never one of those. I enjoyed my time there, but on weekends when everybody was partying, I'd head for the hills with my tent. I got to know some good, out-of-the-way spots. So I'm used to the critters that are around in the mountains. I see deer and elk all of the time. The coyotes won't bother you. People can be scared of them, but personally, I like listening to them at night. Just one time I had this scary situation with a mountain lion. It was just before sunset and I was coming back from a hike. And then all of a sudden it was just there in front of me on the trail. What you're supposed to do is make noise and make yourself look big and tough and slowly back away. Somehow I managed to remember those things even though I was really freaked out. It stared at me for a good long time. But then it just made this kind of snuffling noise and then turned away like I wasn't even worth bothering with. All that to say, I'm no stranger to the comings and goings of the resident creatures. We managed to coexist just fine. After I finished my degree, I was hired to work on the Old Moffat Tunnel. It's a railroad and water tunnel that cuts through the Continental Divide in north-central Colorado. So it's pretty high up there, almost 10,000 feet above sea level. It was given a National Historic Civil Engineering Landmark designation, so I was honored to have a chance to work with it. I got an 18-month contract to work on the restoration. I stayed up there in an old cabin. Everybody else preferred to go back down at the end of the day, so I was alone a lot. It was great, working hard during the day and having peace and quiet and starry skies at night. It's not for everybody, but I loved it. On the weekends, though, a lot of times these crazy kids would come up there to party. The tunnel was some kind of magnet for them. The thing is 24 feet high, 18 feet wide, and 6 miles long. You can imagine the daredevil crap they got into. There are 15 trains a day that go through there. After I'd been up there for about 4 or 5 months, 
these carcasses started showing up near the tunnel entrance. At first, I'm like, these things are getting hit by the trains? But when I got a closer look, they obviously had been eaten with just remnants left behind. There got to be way too many of them just to be typical wild animal kills. I kept removing the piles of fur and bone and burying them as well as I could. I never saw any bears or even another mountain lion after that first one. For some reason, that area had become popular with the college kids as a place to come and do their acid trips. It gave them a real charge to get high and watch the train speeding by. I was worried one of them was going to go too far and do something stupid. I sure wasn't prepared as a medic for full teenagers. They'd come in in the late afternoon. Then they would traipse around the woods acting like they were Robin Hood and his merry men. I'm not kidding you, that was their deal. When it got dark enough, they'd come close to the tunnel and wait. Apparently, the lights and sound from the trains would really send them into another dimension. They'd be gasping and laughing and howling and dancing for hours. I don't know how you manage to make that much emotion for so long. I've never tried it. One night, I tucked myself in bed in my cabin. It was midnight, and I could still hear them rioting around out there. But I was almost asleep. Then I heard screaming. At first, I thought it was all part of the craziness. But no, this was a blood-curdling screaming. I jumped out of bed and into my pants and ran out there. They were all screaming and running in different directions. It was so dark I couldn't see why, but I smelled something powerful, like skunky. I'm thinking, are they smoking something out there? Then I could hear a train coming through the tunnel towards us. When the light came through, I saw the outline of this huge hairy beast. It was incredible, like nine foot tall. The tunnel was 24 feet and this thing almost reached halfway up. It was growling loudly and obviously enraged by that crowd of kids. They scattered everywhere and I assumed that they all made it back to their cars. The train roared by and blocked off the sight of that beast. I ran to the cabin and locked myself in. There was no way that something could be that big. Have you heard of something like this out here in Colorado? It was like a Bigfoot or something. I thought they were mostly found in Oregon. After that, I started going back to town to sleep at night with the other workers. That was a little too much for me. Hello there, Donovan. I've been a fan of yours for a while now. I never really had a supernatural encounter, but after your episode on that neighborhood building in Northern Virginia, I figured I would send this in. My wife and I love the show. Here's my story. I've lived in Charlotte, North Carolina for quite some time now. Charlotte's a beautiful city with so much to do. We don't live far from Panther Stadium, and I get season tickets to all the games through my work. The restaurants around here are some of the best in the world, and I can't imagine living anywhere else. I only have a half-hour commute to work, and life's been pretty good to us overall lately. When I look out my kitchen window, I can see this industrial building with no signage or advertising. And I've often pondered what could possibly be going on inside of that building. At first, I figured it might be a food processing center or something like that. I can see cars coming 24 hours a day, and they park somewhere inside the building, so I never see people get in and out of their cars. There are a couple of things about this place that strike me as being weird. Firstly, all the cars that come and go are new and expensive. Mercedes, BMW, Alfa Romeos, etc. Another distinct characteristic is that all the cars have completely blacked out windows, well above what I know to be the legal limit. I often walk my dog Baxter in a continuous loop trying to figure out what is going on in there. But security is tight, and there is a large gate outside the building where cars can come and go. There is a sign on the gate that says, Scan your ID at the gate so there's no way I could just walk in there and figure out what's going on. Another thing that's been bothering me is the fact that the building is always so dark. You can never see inside no matter what time of day or night it is. It's like the building is purposely trying to hide whatever is going on inside. And then there are the strange noises. Sometimes late at night I can hear this loud humming noise coming from the building. It's like a motor running loudly, but I can't figure out what it could be. It's weird and unsettling. My daughter has claimed to hear anguish screaming coming in that direction. 
But to be fair, that could be coming from anywhere. There are lots of people living around us. Still, I wouldn't count out that the screams came from the building. I don't know what's going on inside that building, but there are some things that aren't right about it. I feel like there may be something illegal happening inside, and I worry about what could happen if investigated further. But at the same time, I can't help but to be curious about what's going on behind those blacked out windows. My friends always think I'm being crazy when I mention the building and they roll their eyes at me. I know I talk a lot about it, but something weird is going on in there. I just know it. My neighbors all have varying opinions about what the facility could be. A couple have told me it's a drug processing plant. A few others speculate that it's a headquarters for a secret government organization. I was having some wine with a neighbor one night who confessed she believed it to be a front for a large-scale illegal weapons operation. My wife jokes with me that it's a covert operations center for a major intelligence agency, but that has been one of the more plausible explanations that I've heard. An older woman who lives nearby said it was an alien contact center where they were receiving instructions from outer space about how to invade Earth. My daughter is convinced it's a center for human cloning or gene manipulation experiments. Besides the screams that she's heard, she's also claimed to see strange men in lab coats escorting non-human entities around the building. She says the windows of the building are blacked out so nobody can see the illegal tests and experiments that they're running in there. Apparently, her friend on the school bus has a dad that works at that building, and he's not allowed to talk about what's going on in there. Every time I think I'm being paranoid, I talk to my daughter and I'm relieved that I'm not the only one. My wife won't entertain it and becomes incredibly irritated when I mention the building now. I guess I've talked about it too many times. I'm not the only one who views this building as something out of the ordinary. I was finally about to get a confession out of one of my neighbors after a couple glasses of wine. He was visibly shaken as he recounted the story to me. I could see the terror in his eyes, and he kept looking around him to make sure nobody else was listening. He said that he saw a van pull up to the building one night, and then saw a man with a cloak over his head and his arms behind his back fall out of the truck. The man got up and started running, and another man in a suit hit him over the head and threw him in the back of the van. The van disappeared into the building, and my neighbor called 911. The operator said they were coming right away but no police ever showed up. My neighbor worries that he's on some sort of government list now because of what he saw. He made me promise not to tell anyone, but how could you not tell people about a story like that? What horror is going on in that building so close to me and my family? Sometimes I feel like I'm going crazy, but your show keeps me sane, Donovan. There are unexplained phenomenon in this world, and if we don't keep investigating, we'll just live in fear and never know anything for certain. I'm looking forward to the next episode. Hey Donovan, you inspired me to write today. I've only told my closest family this story, nobody else. My dog Gunner was my best friend. Gunner was the best dog that I'd ever had. He was always happy and always seemed to know when I needed some cheering up. He would always come over and lay his head on my lap, and before I knew it, I was smiling again. There were so many things that I loved about Gunner. He was always so happy. Even if something bad happened, he would always wag his tail and try to make the best of it. Secondly, he was always so gentle. He never once bit or growled at anyone, even when other dogs were trying to start a fight. He was always so smart, too. He learned how to do so many tricks and he always seemed to understand what I wanted him to do without any trouble. I could go on for hours about how great Gunner was, but I think the most important thing is that he made me happy. Whenever I was feeling down, he would come over and make me feel better. He was truly my best friend, and I miss him dearly. One night, he ran into the woods, and I spent hours trying to find him. It was such a traumatic night for me, and I really don't even like writing about it. I had been walking for hours calling my dog's name. He had run off into the woods earlier that day and I was determined to find him. As the sky grew darker and darker, I began to worry. What if I never saw my best friend again? It was pitch black as I scoured the woods with my flashlight looking for Gunner. I had been calling his name relentlessly for hours, but there was no response. I brought a bag of treats with me in hopes that he would see them and come running back to me. However, 
No matter how long I searched or how loudly I called him, Gunner was nowhere to be found. The woods were quiet and creepy. Every sound made my heart jump, and I constantly scanned the darkness for any sign of my furry friend. Time seemed to be standing still as I wandered through the trees, calling out Gunner's name. Finally, after hours of searching, I had to admit defeat. I went home heartbroken, not knowing if I would ever see my best friend again. The next day, I returned to the woods with my parents. We scoured every inch of those woods, but still couldn't find Gunner. We put up flyers and contacted all the local animal shelters, but no one had seen him. For weeks, we searched tirelessly for my lost dog, but he was nowhere to be found. Finally, one day out of desperation, we placed an ad on Craigslist offering a $500 reward for anyone who could find Gunner. A few nights later, we received a call from someone who spotted him in a nearby park. We drove over there immediately, but the dog they found wasn't Gunner. Devastated, I headed back to the house and figured I would take one last look in the woods before saying goodbye to my friend. I got my flashlight, a bag of his favorite treats, and I headed out. The woods were just as eerily quiet as the night I'd searched for Gunner. I screamed for him as loud as I could as I walked deeper and deeper into the woods. I continued to call his name, but there was no answer. The only sound I could hear was the crunch of leaves under my feet. I was about to finally give up when I saw some sort of creature lying on the ground. My heart sank. Was this Gunner's lifeless body on the ground? I walked slowly towards him, preparing to say my last words. My eyes were filled with tears, heartbroken at what I thought was Gunner. The closer I got to the creature, the more I began to doubt it was Gunner. Was it a dead deer or something else decaying in the woods? It appeared very skinny and tall and gray in coloration. I assumed it had lost all its hair, but the closer I got, I realized it didn't have any hair at all. Was this a dead person in the middle of the woods? I started shaking as I got closer. It had pale, thin skin and looked somewhat human. As I stood directly over the body, shining the flashlight down on it, I saw that it was completely naked and almost skeletal in appearance. I felt nauseous that this thing wasn't human. Suddenly, this thing turned its head and looked right at me and started making this unnerving clicking noise. It had hollow black eyes with no nose and a giant mouth. I immediately turned around and ran as fast as I could back to the house. I had never seen anything like that in my life, and that clicking noise it made still haunts me. To think that this thing is just lurking in the woods next to my house is enough for me to vomit. After wondering what the hell that thing could be, I discovered some articles about a creature called the rake. I started reading all of the accounts of people who have claimed to have seen one. In doing so, I noticed that there were some patterns in the stories. Many people claimed that a rake had hollow black eyes and was terrifying in nature. I also read accounts of people who have harmed themselves after claiming to encounter one. In many of these cases, the victims had left behind a note which described the creature in great detail. Humanoid, pale skin, unnaturally skinny and tall, black hollow eyes, and no nose. I don't know for certain if that's what I saw, but what keeps me up at night is that my beloved dog might have been killed by that creature. That disturbs me deeply as he deserved a long life and a natural death. I miss Gunner every day and I pray I never see that thing again. If any one of your viewers has seen anything similar, can you please let me know? My father was in the military, and my family moved around a lot when I was a kid. When I was about three, we moved into an old farmhouse. My mom had got me a toy fire truck for my birthday, and I loved it. I would play with it all the time. It had lights that would come on when the wheels moved, and a loud siren that you could activate by pushing a button. It was my favorite toy. One morning, I had gotten up early and was playing with my toys on my parents' bedroom floor. My mom was really tired, and she asked me to play quieter so that she could sleep for a couple more minutes. Being only three, I said yes, but kept playing as I had been. Finally, my mom got up and took the fire truck from me to take the batteries out and give it back to me to play with silently. To her confusion, she saw that there were no batteries in the fire truck. Being exhausted, she gave me back the toy and tried to get some sleep. As soon as I started playing with the fire truck again, 
the lights came on and the siren was sounding at full volume. This freaked my mom out and she led me out of the bedroom. That night, my dad got home and my parents started discussing their day. My mom explained the incident with the fire truck to my dad, who immediately laughed it off. My mom was persistent and finally my dad agreed to investigate. After dinner, my mom led my dad into the bedroom and pointed to the fire truck toy on the ground. He picked it up and started fiddling with it. It had no batteries in it and the lights and the siren didn't work. See, my dad said, it just needs batteries. My mom was frustrated. I'm telling you, it was going crazy before. She grabbed it and started messing with it. No lights and no siren. She put it on the ground and told me to play with it. The second my hands touched it, the lights and siren went off. My dad took the fire truck outside, grabbed a baseball bat, and began to repeatedly smash it into oblivion. I was too young to remember any of this, but apparently when my dad got back inside, I told him in a serious tone that Lily was displeased that he broke her fire truck. My mom and dad looked at each other in horror when I said that. Later that night, they put me to bed and laughed it off as an imaginary friend and simple glitch with the fire truck. After everyone went to bed, my parents woke up to a strong smell of smoke. Certain that the house must be on fire, they picked me up and rushed me out of the house in a panic and called 911. The firefighters came, but there was no fire or even smoke in the house. I don't know what happened. A couple weeks later, my grandparents came to visit. We were all eating dinner one night, and my grandmother told me that she has a surprise for me. I jumped up and down, excited, screaming, what is it, what is it? My grandmother laughed and said, eat everything on your plate and I'll give it to you. After eating everything, even the vegetables I hated, I crawled up into my grandmother's lap and said, all done. My grandfather got up and went into the next room to get my surprise. I know your other one broke, so I got you a fire truck, sweetie, my grandmother said to me. I was ecstatic. It wasn't going to be the same toy, but I was going to have a fire truck again. Apparently, I started squealing in excitement and running around the room in a frenzy. Five minutes passed and my grandfather didn't return from the bedroom. Hang on, sweetie, let me help your grandfather find your present, my grandmother said as she left the room. After about five more minutes, my grandparents both came into the living room empty-handed. I must have left it in the car, my grandfather said, and headed out the front door. I'll help you look, my dad said, and quickly took off after him. They were probably out there ten minutes when they came inside empty-handed. My grandfather looked flabbergasted. I was looking forward to seeing you play with your new fire truck, my grandfather told me. Oh, we probably forgot it at home. We will bring it to you next weekend, sweetie, my grandmother said. My mom laughed and said, don't worry, he has enough toys. I was visibly upset, but I quickly forgot about it, and we all sat spending time with each other in our living room. About a half hour later, a strong burning smell started to emanate from the kitchen. I must have left the oven on, my mom said as she ran into the kitchen. My grandmother followed her quickly to help. A few seconds later, we heard shrieks coming from the kitchen. My mom ran out to inform my dad of the situation. Before she could utter a word, I said, Lily is displeased. She liked the other fire truck better. How did? My mom started. My grandmother ran into the room and yelled. The fire truck is in the oven. Why would you put it in there, Frank? My grandfather looked confused. I didn't put the damn thing in there. Well, who did? Shortly afterwards, we moved out of that house. Dad got stationed somewhere else and we went from state to state. I haven't had any paranormal experiences since, and I was too young to remember those events but my family is still haunted by the experience in that house. My mom did some research and learned that a little girl had died in a house fire on that property several years before we got there. Could that be Lily? Is Lily's spirit the reason the fire truck worked without batteries? Did the spirit of Lily cause the house to reek of smoke? Did Lily put that fire truck in the oven? So many unanswered questions, but one thing is for sure, my entire family is happy to be out of that house. I don't think I received any more fire truck toys after that either, but I turned out all right. I had to share my story with you, Donovan. Thanks and take care. Hey, Donovan. I love your show and I listen whenever I have the time. I love listening to the stories of strange encounters. I never thought I would have the same experience, 
but last weekend I did. My name's Tom and I work for the New Jersey State Police. Last weekend I was on duty near the Pine Barrens, out around Egg Harbor City and Weymouth. I like working out there because it's easy and the work I do is pretty tame. Maybe catch a guy speeding or get a few DUIs. It's a lot easier than arresting pimps and hookers in Atlantic City or Camden. Anyhow, it was around 10.30 at night and I was staked out on a roadside with a radar gun on, trying to catch anyone speeding. I was getting pretty damn bored to be honest. Just wanted to get home when my shift was done and get some sleep. Just then I heard the strangest sound I've ever heard. It was this weird cross between like a hooting sound and a screeching. Sounded like the biggest owl you've ever heard in your life. Then something flashed in front of my windshield. I could see these giant wings. They had to be at least 10 feet across. And then I saw the head of this thing. It was really freaking weird. I'd describe it as goat-like, with a long muzzle and these evil red eyes. And the head had these giant horns on top. They had to be at least 12 inches long. The skull looked bony too, like a skeleton head. The thing landed on the roof of the squad car. I could feel its weight deading the top. I grabbed my gun and locked the doors. I wanted to get out and blast it, but I felt frozen inside. I've seen a lot of things in my life. Serial killers, suicide victims, meth heads with no teeth left in their heads. But I've never seen anything like this. I just wanted it to be over. Then I heard glass break and I noticed my back windshield is broken out. Glass is everywhere. There was a strong odor like rotten eggs. Sulfur is what I think they call that smell. Then it was gone. I heard the swoop of the wings and saw it fly off into the headlights. And its long tail was the last thing I saw. So I'm sitting there trying to catch my breath. I called the lieutenant and tried to explain what happened. I call and say, listen, you're not going to believe this, but I'm out in the Pine Barrens, and I think I just saw, and that's when he cuts me off. The lieutenant says, you didn't see anything, okay? I said, sir, but I'm telling you I saw something weird. I think it was a Jersey Devil. Again, he cuts me off. You didn't see anything, understand? And if you keep this up, you're no longer a police officer. You will be fired. Now look, I've got a family. I got a five-year-old son and a three-year-old daughter. I need this job to survive. I had to just say, okay, sir. I know a lot of you out there probably think I'm a wuss for doing that. But hey, it is what it is. I don't know why I was treated like this. Whether it's a cover-up of some kind or what, all I can do is tell my story and I promise every word is true. Oh, and one other thing. The next day I was reassigned to only working North Jersey now. I think they want to keep me out of the way. Hey there, Donovan. I love your show and you're making the world a better place by sharing the wisdom, brother. I'm a believer. To those who don't believe in Bigfoot, please explain to me what tried to kill me last summer. Okay, my mother lives in Ohio and she just turned 70. I figured I'd be a good son and fly down to visit her as a birthday present. I should mention it was a dream of my mom's to live deep in the woods on a ton of land. Her dream came true. She lives in the middle of nowhere surrounded by deep woods with no neighbors. At night after she went to bed, I would sneak out to smoke a cigarette. She would kill me if she knew I smoked. Anyways, one night I went into the woods to burn one and get some fresh air. Everything was going great when out of nowhere I got a whiff of the most rancid smell I've ever smelt in my entire life. It was like a wet dog, burnt hair, and weak old garbage on steroids. My eyes were immediately teared up. I was wondering if my mom was throwing trash out into the woods and turned on the flashlight on my phone. Looking for the trash, the smell kept getting worse and worse. I had to tuck my nose into my shirt and even that was barely helping. I was about to give up when I heard this huge thud on the ground next to me. I flashed my light on it expecting to find a large animal, but it turned out to be a huge rock. Confused, I started looking around me wondering where this thing could have come from. Before I could complete the thought, I heard another boulder whiz by my head. I was seriously freaked out. 
So I charged in the direction the rock came from and yelled some profanities as intimidatingly as I could. The putrid smell overwhelmed me, and before I could turn back, I came face to face with this terrifying ape-like beast. It was like time froze. I saw its beady eyes, furry head, hairy body, and a face like a demonic caveman. I heard a huge growl that was deep, bellowing, and unlike anything I've ever heard before. I sprinted away as fast as I could towards the house. The sounds that came out of this thing were awful. I will never forget the sound of its growl. As I ran, I could hear it coming after me from behind. The sounds of its grunts as it ran still haunt me to this day. I busted through the front door, slammed it behind me, and locked it. The second I turned the lock, the beast banged against the door. I had made it inside safely by seconds. It continued to pound on the door, shaking the entire frame of the house. I had no idea what to do. I stepped back from the door in fear as it kept pounding on the door. My mom came running out of her bedroom screaming, What the hell is that? I couldn't speak. I was in fear for my life. We started grabbing tables and chairs and heavy furniture and began barricading the front door. The sounds finally stopped and I felt a rush of relief flood my body. My mom asked me again, what the hell is that? I didn't have the heart to tell her the truth. So I replied, you have to be careful with bears around here, mom. As soon as I finished my sentence, a huge slam came from the side of the house. I grabbed a kitchen knife and headed over to the sound and prayed I wouldn't have to use the knife. The creature kept pounding on the house. If he kept this up long enough, the wall would actually cave in. Where's dad's shotgun? I asked mom in a panic. She froze. My dad was an avid hunter before he died. But my mom had never held a gun in her life. I grabbed her by the shoulders as the pounding on the walls continued. Mom, this is life or death. Where's dad's shotgun? I don't know. I don't know, she said. Maybe under the bed. I don't know. It was my last hope. I ran into her bedroom and began pulling everything out from under her bed. I threw a box, sewing machine, old yearbooks, and my lacrosse trophies, and all sorts of other junk out of the way. Finally, I felt the cold of the shotgun barrel. I didn't even check if it was loaded. I ran straight back into the living room where this creature was in full swing. Suddenly, silence filled the air. You could hear a pin drop in the house. I heard the wind howling outside and the trees rustling, but no more bashing. I slowly crept out the back door, shotgun at the ready, and crept over to the side of the house. I tried to be as quiet as possible, taking light steps and holding my breath. I could feel my heart pounding as I turned the corner. It was dark outside and I could barely see anything. I went over to where the creature was attacking and the house was ripped to shreds. Debris littered the yard and chunks of wood were ripped off of the house. Large portions were bashed in, and you could begin seeing a faint light from inside the house. Had this continued, it would have broken through the wall in a matter of minutes. The next thing I knew, I hear this terrifying, aggressive roar from behind me. I whipped around and saw the beast sprinting towards me, his huge lumbering arms propelling his giant body towards me at an impressive speed. I closed my eyes, bracing for the impact as I fired off a shot. I heard the dirt as the creature stopped himself with force. Now silence. I fired another shot and heard this strange whooping from the large ape. He took off into the forest so fast I could barely see. I listened to his giant footsteps until they disappeared into the night. I went back inside, mom quivering in fear. Is it dead, she asked. You got to be careful leaving food out around the bear's mom, I replied and went into the guest bedroom. I closed the door and fell to the floor and contemplated how close we came to death. Was it Bigfoot? If you're asking me, what else could it possibly be? Hi, Donovan. I've been a fan of your show for quite a while now. I was never a believer of the paranormal until I had this bizarre encounter that changed my life forever. I live in West Virginia, and I was always a hard skeptic due to my strict Catholic upbringing. 
That changed one night when me and my family were out camping in the woods. It was around 10 p.m. and pitch black outside. We were all sitting around the campfire, enjoying some steaks that my dad had just cooked. Suddenly, my cousin Jimmy said, Did you hear that? We all paused and listened intensely, but we couldn't hear anything. Jimmy insisted that he heard something, so my dad suggested that we go look for whatever it was. We all grabbed our flashlights and walked into the woods. The further we walked, the more uneasy I felt. I had a strong feeling that something was watching us, but I refused to believe that it was anything other than my imagination and Jimmy's paranoia. The woods were eerily quiet. You could hear all three of our feet crunching on the leaves beneath us. No insect sounds, no animal noises, just a profound silence. We had been walking for about 10 minutes when suddenly we heard a loud screeching noise coming from above us. The sound of the screech was absolutely bone chilling. It sounded like a mixture of nails on a chalkboard and the roar of a lion. It sent shivers down my spine and made my hair stand up all over my body. We all looked up and saw a large creature flying directly over us. This beast was huge. I'm talking easily five or six feet tall. It had these big reflective red eyes that almost looked like they were on fire. Its wingspan was unbelievably massive. The only thing I can compare it to are the wings of a giant bat, leathery and veiny, making a thunderous clap as they flapped. It had thick black feathers covering its entire body. I was absolutely petrified and could not believe what I was seeing. My family members were just as scared as I was, and we all ran away screaming in horror. The woods were thick and dark, except for a small circle of light my flashlight emitted. Every rustle of leaves or snap of a branch made me jump and sent my heart racing faster. I could hear Dad's breathing and Jimmy's footsteps ahead of me, but I felt completely alone in the darkness. I was crying and praying and desperately running to survive. I tripped over a branch and collapsed to the ground, twisting my ankle in the process. I heard Dad and Jimmy screams ahead of me. Help! Run! Faster! Go! I broke my flashlight, and to feel my way towards my family's screams, I tried yelling for help, but they were too far ahead of me and screaming too loud to hear me. Finally, my dad started calling for me, and I started to yell loudly enough for him to come look for me. As I saw his flashlight peeking through the trees, I heard the flaps of the beast's wings behind me. I knew it was time to move. I ran towards Dad's flashlight, clenching my jaw as hard as I could to overcome the pain of my twisted ankle. I finally reached my dad, and he started screaming, Go! 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 Suddenly, I heard this loud screeching noise, and something large crashed through the trees towards us. Dad grabbed my hand, and we ran even faster but I could feel the thing gaining on us. My pain from my ankle was intense, but my desire to escape from the creature was far more powerful. The trees were thinning ahead, and I could see the campsite just beyond. We were almost there when Dad suddenly pulled me back, and we hid behind a tree as the creature flew overhead. It had huge wings that spanned at least ten feet, and it was screeching so loudly that I thought my ears would bleed. We were all shaking and crying from terror and relief when we finally got back to the campsite. That night is burned into my memory, and I'll never forget how scared I was. We immediately packed up and drove home. There was no way we were staying in those woods any longer. My family and I spent the entire night trying to discount what we saw, but all of us saw the same thing. We were terrified, and I still don't know what to make of it. Was it an alien? A demon? It was later that we heard descriptions of the Mothman, the red eyes, the bat wings and body, and the anthropomorphic limbs. Could it have been a Mothman that we so desperately ran away from? I was no longer a skeptic, but a believer in the paranormal. I'd experienced the Mothman firsthand, and there was no denying that he existed. I researched the Mothman legend online, and I discovered many people had seen him in West Virginia. He seemed to be drawn to that area for some unknown reason. 
I later learned that the Mothman is often associated with death and disaster. In 1966, there was a bridge collapse in West Virginia that killed 46 people. Some people believe that a Mothman was responsible for the bridge collapse and that he was a warning of impending doom. I don't know if that is true or not, but I do know that it's a creature to be feared. Since my encounter, I've had some nightmares about it flying over me. Its glowing eyes burned into my brain. It's become a permanent part of my life, and I'm always on the lookout for it when I'm camping or driving through West Virginia. I never want to see that again. But part of me is also drawn to it. It's a mystery that I'll never be able to solve, but it's left a mark on me forever. I'm writing you from the Navajo Nation in New Mexico, near the border of Arizona. I felt the need to tell my story and the amazing thing I saw last night. As a Navajo, we've always loved the world and what it can offer. We see beauty in the simplest things. We honor the animals we hunt. When the rains come, we savor the water as it allows the plants to grow again. And we've always looked into the night sky with wonder. Last night, that sky brought something to the earth that I will never forget as long as I live. We were outside performing a healing ceremony for one of our tribal elders who has lung cancer. We were singing and dancing and it was getting late. Just then, the sky became very bright, like the sun in midday. We saw a round circular ship that seemed to fall right to earth, but land gracefully in a way that defied gravity. We heard a loud buzzing sound coming from the ship. The doors opened and out walked what can only be described as an alien, or one of the greys as I've heard people call it. It was short, off-white in color, and had large black eyes, like that of a fly. We all stood frozen in the night. One of the young men from the tribe tried to run forward with his bow to protect the tribe, but the alien just looked at him, and he was frozen and dropped the bow from his hand. In my mind, I remembered the stories of what happened in Roswell, how a ship from the sky had crashed, but the remains were removed and never seen again. I knew that we were now seeing one of them alive. As thoughts raced in my mind, I could sense that the gray could hear what I was thinking. It began putting its own thoughts into my head, communicating without talking. It was telling me stories of how they built the pyramids of Egypt, but man had taken credit for it. The alien walked slowly back and forth looking at us. We smelled a strong earthy smell with a hint of sulfur. It was like whatever planet it was from had different smells than earth. I then told the alien using my thoughts that we were Navajo. We don't live by the ways of modern man. We do not abuse earth. I said your problems are not with us. I told him we have been invaded before, but this is now our land, our reservation, and we want you to leave in peace. The gray spoke to me telepathically again, saying it understood. It said it would attack the big cities, where man makes nuclear weapons. It said soon the world would see destruction like it's never seen before. Just then, it turned around and walked onto the ship again. It walked like a small child would, using its short legs and small steps. The door closed and the ship blasted far above the stars in an instant. The alien was gone. I pray that it never returns and what it said will not come true. I'm a doctor and I'm constantly at the hospital working day and night. Honestly, I see strange things all the time and must shrug it off and keep working. But there is one experience that will always haunt me. If you ask me publicly if I believe in anything that hasn't already been proven with science, I'd say no. But your channel has given me an opportunity to talk about something that has deeply confused me. I was checking on a patient who was experiencing chronic headaches. She kept chanting that they were in control. I had the nurse administer her some pain meds and recommended she be sent to the psych ward. She had no opposition to her recommended treatment, but was adamant that she didn't want to be left alone. When I asked her who they were, she told me that they were reptile demons and that they were going to harvest her soul if she wasn't careful. 
She said that they had been tormenting her for years and that she'd been trying to fight them off, but they were too strong. I tried to comfort her and assure her that we would take care of her, but she pleaded with me not to leave her alone. I spoke with the nurses and we decided to keep a close eye on her and have someone always stay close to her. We also increased her pain medication to help ease her symptoms. I kept in touch with her over the next few days and she seemed to be improving a lot. She wasn't as agitated and was starting to relax quite a bit. The nurses reported that she hadn't been having any strange or out of the ordinary hallucinations recently. She even started to develop some relationships with some of the other patients in the psych ward. It's possible whatever was causing her headaches was also causing the hallucinations, but without further testing, we couldn't say for sure. I advised her to continue taking the pain medication and to let the nurse know if she started experiencing any more hallucinations or if her headaches worsened. One day, I was walking by her room and I saw these menacing shadows on the wall next to her bed. It made me stop and walk backwards to confirm what I was seeing. What I saw next gives me chills to this day. A lizard creature looked at me right in the eyes. It was almost seven feet tall and its skin looked scaly and shiny. It had these huge claws and yellow cat-like eyes that seemed to pierce my soul. I tried to run, but it felt like my feet were glued to the floor. The last thing I remember before passing out was its forked tongue flicking in and out of its mouth. When I came to, the nurses were gathered around my bed with concerned looks on their faces. They asked me what happened and all I could do was tell them to check on that patient's room. A security guard later explained to me that the patient was nowhere to be found and her sheets were ripped to pieces and covered in blood. We never saw or heard from that patient again and we had to call her family and explain that she had left the building and that we were actively looking for her. To this day, the family is still searching for her, but my intuition tells me that nobody will ever see her again. Did the reptile demon succeed in harvesting her soul? The skeptic in me wants to say that she lost her mind, scratched herself furiously, ran out of the hospital, and who knows where she is now. But my intuition tells me that the reality is downright unexplainable. I keep trying to tell myself that I simply saw the reptile demon because my patient had mentioned it earlier and I hallucinated. I keep trying to tell myself that I worked too many hours, saw some strange things that weren't there, and collapsed from exhaustion. That's how I experienced it. I can still make out every detail of that lizard creature. I haven't even told my spouse that this happened to me and I really thought I was going to take this experience to my grave. My nephew showed me an episode of your show on YouTube, and that's why I'm writing to you today. Do I really think there are lizard people out there roaming around? Absolutely not. It simply just sounds too absurd to me. Do reptilians exist in any capacity? No, the only reptiles are simply that, reptiles. Did I see the lizard creature in my patient's room? Undeniably, yes. That's why it bothers me even so much even today. Everything I know and believe tells me that what I saw I shouldn't have seen. But I remember it like it was yesterday. And now when people share their paranormal experiences, my ears perk up. I feel it necessary to include that I'm not on any medication and wasn't on any at the time of my encounter with what my patient referred to as the reptile demon. Now, of course, I haven't seen anything like that before or after that event, and I don't expect to see anything this strange ever again, but the hospital has never felt the same to me since. My patients are always sharing the craziest stories with me of what goes on in their rooms, and I want to share my experience with them and to let them know that they aren't crazy, but I never will, though. If I was in the hospital and my doctor said he saw a seven-foot lizard creature in my room, I wouldn't hesitate to find another doctor. Maybe someday we'll be able to share our personal experiences and not live in fear of what others might think. Until then, I'll keep listening to your channel with conflicting emotions and try to keep an open mind. I've never written into a show before, but the experience I had is keeping me up at night. I'm hoping if you read it, someone will say something in the comments. 
like they've heard of this or maybe even seen one themselves. I live near Franconia Notch in New Hampshire. I'd prefer not to say the actual town name, but it's a pretty small town, a Christian community. I'm afraid of what my neighbors would say if I told them I saw this thing on my property. We have black bears here and they're always getting in your trash cans. I've even seen a young black bear robbing bird seed from my bird feeder. So when I kept finding my cans overturned, I felt pretty strongly that bears were the culprit. I don't believe in shooting animals. I don't own a gun. When I see bears near the house, it's usually enough to go out with a couple of frying pans and clang them together. Unless you get between a mother and her cubs. Bears around here at least are pretty easy to scare off. Where I live is pretty far from any real city, and there's not much reflected light. It gets really dark, but the upside is you can see a lot of stars. Since I was having trouble with my trash cans, I installed some of those motion sensor lights on the back of my house. A few weeks ago, I was settled in in front of the TV in my living room, watching the 11 o'clock news, when the motion sensor lights came on, and I heard a trash can get knocked over. So I scrambled up and ran into the kitchen to grab a couple of saucepans. Then I rushed out to the back door to catch the bears in the act. I figured if I could do this a few times and make a lot of noise right when they were scrounging the cans, they'd associate the unpleasant sound with the act and maybe find someone else to bother. But when I got out on my back porch, I didn't see any bears. The lights were blazing and I scanned the yard, but all I saw was overturned trash cans. There were bags on the ground that had spilled out, but nothing had been torn open. I figured when the lights came on, the bear took off. At least that's what I thought at the time. I wasn't wearing shoes, but I knew I'd better toss the bags back in and secure the lid, or the raccoons would come by and make a mess. I stepped back into the kitchen and put on my wellies, then tromped out into the yard. I bent down to pick up one of the bags, but then I noticed the black plastic had beads of moisture on it. It hadn't rained for a few days, and I was pretty sure inside of the can was dry. I was about to pick it up, but I was kind of grossed out, wondering if the animal, the bear, the raccoon, had urinated on it. I sniffed the air, but I didn't smell anything. I decided to play it safe and walked around to the side of the porch where I keep a pair of latex gloves. I was rummaging through the shelves on the porch looking for the gloves. When the backyard light timed out since I wasn't in the yard. It was annoying since now I had no illumination to help me find the gloves, but I found them a few minutes later without having to go back inside and get a flashlight. I stepped back onto the grass and headed through the side yard to the back, where the trash cans were. When I got to the corner of the house, the motion detector kicked in, and the floodlights came back on. What I saw stopped me in my tracks, my blood running cold. It defied explanation. There was a creature like nothing I've ever seen before, crouched over the trash bags. It had almost a human form except it was really gaunt, and the head was elongated. It was completely naked and hairless, even its head, and its skin was kind of a weird pale color. It was crouched down on all fours like an animal. I didn't know what I was seeing. My mind just couldn't process it. I gasped and the thing looked up. Its face was absolutely terrifying. Big, black, oval-shaped eyes, no nose at all. Its mouth was just this open, black pit. I think it saw me watching it because it suddenly made this weird clicking sound. I stumbled back, too afraid to even run, and this thing scooted away, super fast. It was like a blur it was so fast, on all fours the whole time. The yard lights were still on, and I could see it now crouched on the side of the garage. When I say crouched on the side of the garage, I mean literally it was defying gravity, crouched on all fours, somehow clinging to the side wall of my garage. My eyes were glued to it. I was too afraid to turn my back on it. I was so scared I felt like I was going to pass out. It skittered away, and suddenly it was on the roof of the garage. The way it moved was almost the most frightening aspect. It was there, and then it was somewhere else. Then the light yards went out, because I had stayed motionless for a few minutes, and then the thing was out of range. So for a split second, I'm in the absolute darkness with this creature. 
I took two tiny steps forward, and then the lights came back on. Thank God. I looked at the roof, but it was gone. It was several more minutes before I was brave enough to move towards the backyard. But I knew if I didn't move, the lights would go out again. I had to come out to the back door, and that was the only door that was unlocked. I didn't see it again. I got back inside the house and locked the doors and the windows. I left the garbage can overturned on the grass, and the bags right where they lay. Raccoons and bears were the least of my worries. I haven't got a decent night of sleep since that incident. Well, that's my story. I'll be curious to know if anyone else has ever seen this creature, and if they have any more information about it. I hope it never comes back. I can't even make myself go outside at night anymore. My grandfather had something really strange happen to him when he was seven years old. He was playing in the backyard and was suddenly overwhelmed by the smell of rotting garbage or something decomposing. He decided to investigate and started poking around at the edge of the woods that bordered the yard. Grandpa moved branches and the foliage with a long stick, but he didn't see anything out of the ordinary. Both of his parents had told him many times not to go in the woods alone, but the smell got stronger and the curiosity pushed him into the trees. He stepped carefully, sure that he was close to a dead raccoon or possum and not wanting to step on it. Grandpa kept going, and in just a few minutes he came to a small clearing that he didn't recognize. The smell of rotted garbage was so thick that he was nearly choking. But that wasn't the weirdest part. Directly in the middle of the clearing was something that definitely did not belong. When he told me the story, he described it as a silver Rubik's Cube, and it was four or five stories high. The outside was covered in what Grandpa's seven-year-old brain identified as armor of some kind that glowed a bit where the sunlight was hitting it. It was completely smooth, and there was a walkway of some kind leading down to the ground. Standing at the bottom of the walkway were two figures that looked mostly human, except for their weird clothing and elongated heads. It looked like they had been waiting for him. Once they spotted him looking at them, they started beckoning at him, waving him closer with hands that only had three long fingers. They were wearing what looked like what my grandfather identified as work clothes, some kind of overall or jumpsuit that looked like they were made out of the same material as rain boots. They were taller than Grandpa, but definitely not giants. Grandpa couldn't help himself. He started walking towards them. He said that it felt like an invisible rope was pulling him closer, step by step. He wasn't afraid at all, just insanely curious about what was inside that shiny cube. By now, he had decided that these figures must be aliens. He'd seen them in his older brother's science fiction magazines, and he knew that they came from the far reaches of the galaxy. But his older brother had told him that all the stories were all made up. Grandpa couldn't wait to tell him about this. Before he knew it, he was up the walkway and inside the ship. There was one alien on either side of him, but they weren't touching him. It was bright inside, but he couldn't see any wires or light bulbs. It was like the walls in a long hallway were lit from within. It seemed to stretch out for miles on either side and seemed much bigger on the inside than it appeared from the outside. The trio started walking down the hallway. The aliens were chattering away with each other in a series of chirps and clicking sounds. But Grandpa didn't think they were trying to talk to him. He did take a moment to wonder why he wasn't scared. A year earlier, a little boy had disappeared from the small town where my grandfather's family lived. So he'd received many lectures about avoiding strangers and the danger of going off with someone he didn't know. He knew this wasn't what his parents had in mind during those conversations. But who could have possibly imagined this? Grandpa didn't see any stairs or doors on their long walk. He wanted to see the place where the aliens flew the ship. He also didn't see anything that hinted towards the cause of the rotten smell. So realized it must have been coming from the aliens themselves. The taller alien finally stopped in front of a portion of the wall that looked exactly like the rest to my grandfather's eyes. He reached inside of his jumpsuit and pulled out a card, 
which he waved in front of the wall and then it slid open. And that is when Grandpa started to get a bit nervous. It looked like a doctor's office with a table in the middle of a large room. There were some machines clustered around the table, but more alarmingly, there were eight more aliens standing there. They stood in a line with their hands clasped in front of their bodies. The two accompanying my grandfather each grabbed one of his little arms, but they didn't have to drag him to the table because his feet were still moving under some other power. He walked right to the table and then stepped up on the little stool that seemed to be there for just that purpose. Grandpa sat on the edge of the table, his legs dangling over the side. What was going to happen? Would they hurt him? Would they take them back to their planet? Would he ever see his family again? One of the aliens approached, chirping softly. It slowly reached out a hand and patted my grandfather on the head. And then it pulled a giant pair of scissors out of nowhere. My grandfather finally started yelling, and that was the last thing he remembered. When he woke up, he was lying in his own backyard, just a few yards from the porch. He could hear his mother yelling in the house, saying that it was time for everyone to get up for the day. It was chilly and his head and feet were really cold. He ran his hands over his body, but nothing hurt or seemed out of place. Grandpa reached up his hand to his scalp and found that his hair was completely cut away in some places. And that is where the story ended. When I asked him what happened next, he just said, I got in trouble for cutting my own hair. He never told his parents about any of it because he didn't want to get yelled at for going into the woods alone. Hey Donovan, I have a story for you. I would rather not say exactly where I live, but it's in the southeastern part of the United States, near a national government laboratory. Many of the employees at the laboratory are not allowed to talk about the projects they are working on outside of work. However, it's not uncommon to corner an uncle or a friend that is employed there and try to weasel information out of them. They will sometimes drop tidbits or even tell crazy things that are not classified. One night, after an uncle of mine had a few too many drinks, he started talking about this creature they kept at the lab. He described it as stickly, thin, bone-like, and bald. He said its eyes were too big for its head, and its hands and feet had long, bony appendages. He said he had seen it deep in an underground bunker located under the lab. My uncle was an architectural engineer. He had been called in to determine the structural integrity of a bunker. According to him, the government had built a shelter during World War II, and whatever was being kept there was breaking it down. My uncle had been led deep into the complex and down several tunnels until he arrived at the bunker. He said the bunker resembled a bank vault, like those from old bank heist movies. He said the escorts had instructed him not to look at the back of the structure, just the interior section tied to the hallway. At first, he said nothing stood out, but then he looked up and saw evidence that something dangerous was being kept inside the bunker. He said that there were claw marks deep into the walls. He was baffled because the bunker was made of thick concrete and steel. He said it would be impossible for a human or a wild animal to leave those marks on the wall. After examining the walls, he said aloud that they should still hold for several years. At his prognosis, he said he had heard a terrible sound from the back of the bunker. It sounded like a wail and a high-pitched screech in one. Without thinking, he quickly turned and peered into the back of the bunker. It was then that he spotted the creature. He said it was restrained in a seated position, so he could not tell its full height or size. He said the guards quickly rushed him from the room and had more guards posted in the front of the bunker. One guard escorted him back to the surface level and out of the tunnels. The guard took him to an office, and they repeatedly asked him questions about what he had seen. He said he knew better than to admit that he saw it. He kept repeating that it was dark and only saw the front of the room. The laboratory is surrounded by acres and acres of woods. Armed guards patrol the perimeter, and signs are posted everywhere that it is a violation to cross the boundary and many employees have told me that snipers are scattered throughout to stop intruders. Hunters occasionally drift near the perimeter, but no one crosses it. 
However, one side of the lab is a rural highway. It goes directly along the side of the border. It is a narrow two-lane road that locals use only to reduce their commute time. On this road late one night, I saw some strange lights floating above the road directly ahead. As my car approached, the lights seemed to be the same distance ahead. I began to have wild ideas, but then quickly smashed them for the thought of, someone has a drone. Yep, some kid has a new birthday present. Then the lights started to speed up and move from side to side. I wasn't sure what to think at that point. The next thing I know, the lights do this wild swirl and then nosedived into the woods up ahead to my left. Next, as if they had been following or chasing this object, a surge of lab police vehicles swarmed the wooded area. They didn't seem to notice me and my little black Civic and all of the commotion. I heard the worst noise when I came closest to the spot on the road to where the lights crashed. It was this screeching wail. My windows were up and the noise was still off the charts. I pushed my foot on the gas and quickly passed the commotion and made it off the remote road. For weeks, I watched the local news and listened for any indication that something had happened on that remote road. Yet, nothing was ever said. In my mind, that noise came from a creature like the one my uncle had seen trapped in a bunker years ago. I don't know if it was the same creature or its companions that had come to rescue it, but I went from a skeptic to a believer. Thanks, Lynn. Hi there, Donovan. Thanks for getting this content out to the people. My strange encounter happened about a year ago. I know this story is not one of your typical encounters, but it happened. I have seriously been shaken ever since. I work at a national park in Kentucky. It's called Mammoth Cave. Mammoth Cave is a massive cave system currently known as the most extensive cave system in the world. It has over 420 miles of explored tunnels. It is still expanding. The portion outside the cave is a large park as well. It's a great place to take the family on vacation. Families hike and kayak and explore the caves. However, as I say this, I also preface with being cautious of your time inside the cave. I have worked at many parks throughout my career. I have a niche in war history, specifically weaponry. Mammoth Cave was an exciting placement for me. The bats that live in the cave produce guano, bat poop, a key component in potassium nitrate better known as saltpeter, used during earlier wars. Enslaved people were forced to mine it. Several artifacts from that period have been recovered from the cave. I am not one to typically believe in wild tales, but after my encounter I discovered your channel, hoping to make sense of what I saw. Honestly though, it has led me to believe that many things in our big world are unexplained. Anyhow, I digress. Part of working the caves means giving tours. Tours become monotonous quickly. Tourists are always asking the same questions and I'm giving out the same answers over and over. It's rinse and repeat. I always try to be engaging. It was Tuesday in the second tour that I had given that morning. I had a relatively large group of people. Part of the group was a family of three, a mom, dad, and a girl about the age of 10. The family was relatively quiet, but seemed engaged throughout the tour. Of course, the cave comes with its legends. Some of these are spirits that haunt the cave, but I never gave this much thought. I never even considered that there was such a thing as a ghost. I would, of course, tell the stories in the hope of engaging my audience, but I had never seen anything to make me believe that there was any truth to it. As I led my group to the haunted chamber, I noticed the temperature had changed. The temperature change seemed odd because the cave keeps a consistent 54 degrees once inside and away from the entrance. Over my time working within the cave system, I had been accustomed to the temperature. I remember thinking that perhaps I was getting sick. As I began speaking to the group, the internal light system glitched. The lights were not going off, but they were dimmed. The lights dimming was unusual. During this, I glanced at the family standing before me to the right. The daughter suddenly pitched forward like someone had shoved her from behind. Her dad's quick reflexes saved her from a fall. I asked if she was okay, and she said someone had pushed her. 
The strange thing was, her family was to the side, and no one was behind them. I checked that she was okay and had my partner continue with the group while I attended to this family. As I leaned down in front of the girl, rocks started shuffling behind her. Small stones about the size of driveway gravel began rolling. The ground was unlevel in this chamber section, but not enough for the previously undisturbed stones to move. I told the family that we should catch up with the group and leave now. As we exited the chamber, I saw someone's back as they rounded a rock outcropping, thinking that this was another tour member trying to be funny, by being disruptive with the historic site. I quickly returned to the area to confront them. Guess what, Donovan? Nothing. No one was there. The entire room was empty but for myself. There was nowhere someone could have hidden or gone to escape. I am nervous and anxious and a little sick at this point. I quickly caught up to the group and luckily we were at the end of the tour. I took the rest of the day off and debated returning to work the next day. I'm unsure if it was the girl, the time we were there, or me. I have no idea. But there is truly something supernatural inside Mammoth Cave. Got a short story for you, Donovan, from my home in West Virginia. I live in a city in the north of West Virginia called Fairmont. But this happened at my buddy's hunting cabin in Berkeley County. Berkeley County is one of the easternmost counties of West Virginia, and it sits at the top of the Shenandoah Valley. The Shenandoah Valley is part of the Appalachian Trail. The trail is a hiker's paradise. It goes down the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's truly a beautiful area. My buddy has a hunting cabin that is pretty remote in this area. I believe it was family land handed down. He rarely goes, and the cabin had not been used at that time for a few seasons. When my buddy suggested that we take a long weekend to be mountain men, what we call hunting, fishing, and roughing it, I was all in. We packed light because the cabin does have some of the necessities like running water. The trip into the cabin was great. The views are truly unmatched. We arrived on a Thursday afternoon and settled in for the night. Everything in the cabin seemed to be in order as we quickly glanced about. Besides finding a snake in the woodpile, the afternoon was relatively uneventful. We were pretty beat and we went to sleep around dark so it was probably around 9 p.m. Near 1 in the morning, something made a noise outside my room. It startled me awake. It sounded like something had fallen. Knowing that the cabin had not been in use and most likely wild animals had become comfortable coming close, I thought it was most likely a deer or a raccoon. I must have drifted off to sleep because when I startled awake again around 1.45, this time there was a loud boom. My buddy had woken up too. He was on the other side of the cabin. Both of us quickly grabbed our guns and a light. We tried at first to peer out of the little window in the cabin, but due to it being small and unclean, it was impossible to really see out. Then we decided to creep out and see what caused the commotion. As we slowly and quietly slid out the front door, we saw that the heavy wooden bench that sat out front had been tossed upside down about five feet away. The area is known to have bears and wild boar. The bears can be quite large, and the boar are just stupid destructive. Yet not a single creature was in sight. It was late and I was on edge. We decided it would be best just to hunker down for the night. The original plan was that we would get up super early Friday morning to hunt. But after the night we had, we decided we wouldn't go until after daylight. At daylight, we began poking around outside. We didn't realize it at first, but then we realized there were faint tracks all around the cabin. The tracks were odd. The creature was for sure not a bear or a wild boar. This thing had a foot span longer than a typical man's. We measured it about 14 inches long. It favored the outside of its feet, so a width measurement was impossible to get accurately. I wear a size 12 shoe, and it was easily wider and longer. The creature seemed to have toes or something. At this point, I started searching Google to see what type of tracks these could be. So my buddy and I decided to start having breakfast. He had brought a grill for us to cook on, so we went to the truck to dig it out. This quickly turned into some frantic hollering. 
During the night, whatever had flipped the bench had obviously helped themselves to most of the supplies in the back of the truck. The grill was still there, most likely due to it not being super portable. But our extra hunting gear had been taken. Our cooler was gone, and so were several of our knives. Luckily, we had brought all the guns inside when we arrived. We also had to begin to entertain the idea that some druggy mountain people had stumbled upon us last night. It didn't exactly explain the bench, but it did the stealing. And then we had a decision to make. We could try to salvage what we could and stay till Sunday, the original plan, or we could take off. I was ready to leave, but I didn't want to admit it. My buddy still wanted to stay and do some exploring. I think he was sore about having been stolen from and was hoping to come across his stuff. After breakfast, we decided to do some scouting. We took off on foot with our hunting rifles. We had probably walked about 15 minutes when we approached the creek that borders one side of his property. We were ready to follow the creek for a bit when I spotted something orange across the creek. We waded through a narrow part of the channel and found that the orange item was my hunting safety vest. It looked like it had been dropped. At this point, my buddy wanted to continue in the direction the vest was left to see if we could find the thieves. We continued on, but at this point I was getting a little spooked. Then my friend pointed out a cave, a huge open mouth cave. My buddy is all pointing and trying to whisper that the druggies might be hiding out there. Then something happened. A large creature, hunkered like a bear, moved to the mouth of the cave. It was on all fours, but its back was angled high. It was covered in this shaggy fur like a sheepdog would have. It was brownish and black. I couldn't see its face, only its back and a little bit of its side. At this point, it slowly started to rise. It kept rising, slowly lifting its large, heavy body. I was a good distance, but it was easily over seven feet tall. It didn't have any clothing on, only shaggy, hairy fur. I stood completely still, afraid to move or even breathe. This thing stealthily moved into the cave. At this point, I am done. No amount of convincing would have kept me hanging around. I glanced at my buddy, and he was the same. As quietly as possible, we moved back towards the creek. We crossed and then ran back to the cabin. Without saying a word, we packed up our stuff and took off. It was probably about 10 minutes up the road when we finally began to really speak. We decided to stop by the sheriff's office. The sheriff's office was a laid-back place. Funny enough, it even had coffee and donuts sitting out on the counter when we went in. We asked to speak to someone in private about some items being stolen. I think we were obviously scared of what we would say when we began to speak. The receptionist walked us back to a small office. Sitting at the desk was an officer, and he asked, what could he help us with? I finally worked up the nerve and explained that we had been hunting at a cabin on the North Rim, and that we had been woken in the night to some items being stolen from our vehicle. He asked for a more specific location, and when we gave him a closer address, he began to smirk. He asked what we did after the items were stolen, and we described our morning. When I told him about the creature, he did put on a more serious face. In a draw, he said, You two are lucky. We have a bandit of sorts on that mountain. Most see evidence of him passing through, but very few have been able to catch a glimpse. Gentlemen, thank you for your time in Berkeley County, and have a safe trip home. Needless to say, the cabin has now been officially abandoned. My buddy hasn't been back, and as far as I know, no one else has. It's a story we tell friends, but no one ever believes us. I know what I saw and there is a giant creature that lives in that cave. Hey Donovan, I love your channel and I always listen to your videos before bed. For some reason, the crazy encounters people have with paranormal creatures soothe me and make me feel saner. I want to tell you about something that happened to me a couple years ago. To this day, I haven't told another soul this story, but I'm curious to know what you think of it. I was making a cross-country trip to visit my parents. It was a very dark night as I drove through the winding roads of Connecticut. I was making pretty good time and I was hoping to get to their house before too late. I remember I was going around this wide turn and I saw three wild dogs run into the road and stop dead in their tracks. I slammed on the brakes and was able to stop well before hitting the dogs. 
I sat there watching the dogs for a while as they didn't run off the road. They were there in the middle of the road staring at me in the car. I honked at them trying to encourage them to run away, but they just kept looking at me. About a minute went by and all three of them, with their heads lowered close to the ground, started walking towards me. As they got closer, I realized these weren't normal dogs, or even wolves. They were something else entirely. They had these insane red eyes that glowed brightly in the dark and were huge. They were snarling and growling, and the creatures started spreading out strategically, looking like they were going to try to attack. I'd never seen anything like these creatures before. The hair on the back of my neck stood up, and a feeling of pure dread washed over me. Even in the safety of my car, I began fearing for my safety as these things meant business. I thought about flooring it towards these beasts, but they were so much bigger than any dog that I'd ever seen, and the impact would have assuredly rendered my car undrivable. Seeing no other option, I put the car in reverse and hit the gas. The dogs, or whatever they were, began to run after me, keeping pace with the car easily. No matter how fast I went, they stayed right in front of me seeming to almost glide across the pavement. They showed no signs of tiring. After a few minutes of this, I came to an intersection and aggressively whipped around the car and tore off down the road. I was able to put some distance between me and the giant demon dogs, and I felt a huge wave of relief wash over me. I considered calling 911, but I wasn't sure if they would even believe me or if they'd even be able to do anything. After all, how do you explain something like this? Even if they dispatch a police cruiser or animal control, there's no guarantee that they would be able to do anything against creatures like this. I was able to take an alternate route safely to my parents' house, but I never forgot about this encounter. The thing I remember most about these beasts were their eyes, incredibly wide and as red as embers in a bonfire. I remember looking at their eyes just knowing I was in danger. I've been encountered by wild animals before, and usually there's an element of fear that you can clearly see. In these black dogs' eyes, there was no fear, and it was clear that they would enjoy killing me. Part of me wondered if it wasn't me that they wanted to eat, but my very soul. I researched these creatures obsessively, and it turns out I'm not the only person to have experience with these demon dogs. Most people refer to them as hellhounds, and I remember reading about this crazy event back in 1577. During this encounter, apparently hellhounds broke through the door of a church and savagely killed several members of the congregation. It was reported to have even caused the roof of the building to fall to the ground. For centuries, stories of hellhounds have been told along the east coast of England. These fearsome beasts are said to have black eyes like saucers and often travel in packs led by men on horseback. Though the stories have largely spread through word of mouth, the earliest written record of a hellhound dates back to the 11th century. Could these creatures be more than just a legend? If you ask me, I don't know what else I could have possibly seen that night. What makes these stories so fascinating is that they have persisted for centuries despite there being no concrete evidence that such creatures exist. There are many theories as to what the hellhound might be, ranging from a natural phenomenon to a supernatural being. Some believe that the hellhound is simply a product of overactive imaginations, while others believe that it's an omen of death, or an unworldly creature sent to terrorize us. I was never particularly interested in the paranormal, but this experience shook me to my core. I've dealt with some evil people in my life, but I've always viewed animals as saintly and innocent. No longer, those demon dogs were pure evil, and I believe them to be under the control of Satan himself. I've often wondered why they would come after me. Was I being punished for something? Was it something that I did that I haven't repented for? I wonder if I'll ever see something like that again. I hope not. Thanks for listening to my story, Donovan, and thank you for giving a voice to those who fear being subject to ridicule. It's been healing to get this off of my chest. Hi, Donovan. First, I want to say I'm a big fan of your show, and I'm glad I'm not the only one who's seen something weird out there. My experience was in western North Carolina. 
in the Smoky Mountains. I don't know if you've ever been there, but that area is like heaven on earth. Just so much wilderness left. Mountains and rivers and trees for miles. There's three national forests and a bunch of state parks. Hundreds of acres that you can camp and fish. So I go at least once a month in the summer. Anyway, I found this sweet camp spot. Just about three quarters of a mile to hike in. Not too bad. It was a primitive site. Of course, no electricity, but no big deal. It was pretty close to Lake Santitla and right on the Santitla Creek. It's called a creek, but it's really more like a river. Pretty fast and deep. Good place to catch trout. So I set up my camp and I made sure to hang my food up. Just enough for snacks and dinner, in case I didn't catch any fish. They got black bears out there, so you don't want to have any cooler at your site, or even worse, in your tent. I got everything all set up, and then I grabbed my gear and hit the river. Man, that is the best place to fish, I gotta tell you. Those rainbow trout practically jump out on the bank for you. I caught three nice-sized ones and headed back to camp. I figured I'd laze around in my chair and drink a beer or two. It was still pretty early, maybe mid-afternoon. So I'm out there alone, you know. There's no one else out there for miles as far as I could tell. It's not a campground, it's out in the woods. I hadn't seen a soul since I left the paved road. But I get back to my camp and you know what? There's my food stash, or what's left of it I should say. Just wrappers and trash, but the cans are still there. At first, I thought, okay, something managed to get up here and rip open the mesh bag. Maybe a raccoon or something. Then I saw the rope. I had tied a good strong knot in that rope, and it was untied, and the bag wasn't ripped either. Now, I know a coon can be pretty dexterous. Open a latch cooler up, but untie a knot? I don't know about that, but whatever. It made me scratch my head a bit. But I kind of shrugged thinking it was a good thing that I had caught some fish. Until later that evening. That night I was sitting at my campfire. Feeling all full and lazy after dinner. When I heard this weird noise. It was a clacking sound. Like two stones being hit together. At first I thought it was a branch snapping. But no. It was definitely rock on rock. Like a clack, clack, clack. So I'm a little weirded out, but still more puzzled than anything. Then the sound moved to the other side of the woods. It was on my left. Then a few minutes later, it was on my right. Same thing, the same clacking sound. Then it's coming from behind me. Okay, now I'm getting freaked out. I stood up and said, hello, real loud. Silence, no more clacking. I was starting to get the heebie-jeebies but I piled more wood on the fire to make it brighter, and I had another beer to settle my nerves. It stayed quiet after that. The quiet and the beer and my full belly all made me sleepy. I started dozing in my chair, so I decided it was time to turn in. The fire had burned down pretty low, so I didn't douse it with water. I just got in my tent. I had a few brews, though, so of course I woke up needing to pee. It was almost dawn, and there was a little light coming in through the trees. I put my boots on and was standing right there by my tent when I saw something move. I just froze. There was something standing in the trees about 20 feet away, and it stood upright like a person. But there is no way in hell that was a man. It was way too big for one, and it was kind of furry, like a gorilla, I guess. Its back was to me. Of course, the first thing that came to mind is Bigfoot. I never really believed all those stories, but I'm standing there, and there's this beast right in front of my eyes. I don't know what it could have been except for a Bigfoot. So I'm scared out of my mind. I zip back up, trying to be quiet, but it must have heard my zipper, because all of a sudden, it turns around and stares right at me. Its face wasn't hairy at all. It looked like a man, more like a primitive man, a caveman, but its eyes, that's what really freaked me out. They were almost glowing a bit. My heart was pounding, but you know they say with a bear, don't run. And I guess I was thinking that, because I just tried to slowly back up. I backed up maybe three steps before this thing made any noise. It growled, really menacing. I just lost it and ran like hell. I always keep my keys in my pocket so I had them on me. There was no way I was leading that thing back to my tent. I ran back down the trail in the direction of my car. 
I had to stop behind a tree and catch my breath, so I tried to listen. I don't think it followed me. I didn't hear anything, but I didn't waste any time getting back out to my truck. I stayed in the truck with the doors locked, but I didn't go to sleep. When morning came, I went back to the campsite to collect all my gear. I was half afraid the tent would be shredded or something, but no, everything was just like I'd left it. I looked around for footprints, thinking if I could find a print and take a picture, I'd have proof, but I never found anything. Pretty damn spooky, though. I'm not sure I'll be camping in that forest anytime soon. So to all the Bigfoot hunters out there, you know where to go. Hey Donovan, I just wanted to let you know that I've seen every one of your videos, and I drop what I'm doing every time I see you release a new one. Ever since I was a child, I was fascinated by the paranormal, but my deep interest in the unknown stems from one experience I had when I was young. Growing up, I was what they call a latchkey kid. I was raised by a single mother who worked multiple jobs, and I would head straight home to our apartment after school and lock the door. One day I got inside and went to the fridge where my mom would leave a note for me every day. This particular note said, The repair man came and fixed the shower today. This was especially exciting to me since I hadn't showered in several days. I scarfed down whatever leftovers my mom put in the fridge for me and ran into the bathroom to enjoy a shower. I specifically remember feeling the heat from the shower. It made me realize how much I took a nice shower for granted. My mom and I didn't have much growing up, but it reminded me just how lucky I was. I wish the story ended there, but what happened next forever changed my opinion on the supernatural. I remember I was washing my hair when I saw a figure's shadow pass by the shower curtain. I wasn't expecting my mom home for several hours, so it freaked me out seeing the shadow. Mom, I said, and I waited for a response. A few moments passed and there was absolute silence. I peeked out from the shower curtain to see my bathroom completely empty. On top of that, I had locked the door so there was no way anyone was in there with me. I assured myself that my mind must be playing tricks on me. Admittedly, it wasn't the first time I was freaked out being alone in the apartment, but this time felt different. I had an uneasy feeling in my stomach. I kept showering and tried to calm my nerves. And then next, directly behind my head, I heard an unsettling breathing noise. It sounded like a threatening hiss, but not like from an animal, one from a human. This terrified me and I whipped around towards the noise. There was nothing there, but this seriously made me panic. I wrapped the bath towel around me and jumped out and ran into the kitchen. I didn't even turn off the water. I just knew I wanted to get out of there immediately. As I caught my breath, I stared at the bathroom doorway trying to justify what I heard. Perhaps my mind was playing tricks on me again. Maybe it was a sound coming from the neighbors, but nothing calmed me down. I knew something was off. Finally, I was able to muster enough courage to head back to the bathroom. After all, mom would kill me if she knew I left a shower running for 20 minutes. I took a deep breath and I turned the faucet off. As soon as I turned the handle, I heard a deep rumbling. It sounded like a voice. I swear I heard, get out. An overwhelming sense of terror washed over me and I ran out of the bathroom and out of the apartment. I slammed the door behind me and took off down the hallway. I got halfway down when it had dawned on me that I still only had a towel wrapped around me. I knew I had to go back and get some clothes on, but I was physically shaking and terrified. As I got back inside, it no longer felt like my home. It was as if if someone or something took possession, it was making it clear it no longer wanted me in there. A dark energy filled the air, and it was hard to breathe. I wanted nothing more to go into my bedroom and get some clothes, but I couldn't bring myself to move a muscle. I sat down at the front door trying to calm myself down. It took several hours, but I finally got myself breathing again and feeling somewhat normal. I decided to watch some TV and just try to shake off this experience. Finally, my mom came home and I told her about seeing the figure, hearing the hiss, and hearing something say, get out. My mom's face went white. She explained to me that a friend had come over earlier and they were talking about the spirit world. They figured they would have some fun with the Ouija board and at first weren't getting any response. Finally, they started antagonizing the spirits, 
saying that they weren't strong enough to make the magnifying glass move. It was at this point that the magnifying glass did move, and it spelled out two words, get out. They immediately put the board away, and after that, the friend was so shaken up that she left immediately afterwards. About a week or so later, my mom had a priest come in and bless the apartment. She threw the Ouija board away, and we never spoke about it again. My mom was terrified of anything related to the paranormal after that, but it permanently opened it up for me. If something could have that drastic of an effect over my life, I needed to do everything in my power to make sure it never happened again. Donovan, your show is a major resource to me, as I can learn more about what average people like me experience when it comes to the realm of the supernatural. There is just so much out there that we don't understand. Every day is an opportunity to learn. And if we stop learning, we stop living. Thanks for the hard work and the videos and sharing the valuable insight. Thanks so much and take care.